Velkommen alle sammen! Arm rings! What is the purpose and spiritual meaning of these bad boys, these bling in the Viking Age? Because you've all been asking for a long time, thank you for being patient. I had the video done and researched a while back. I was waiting to release it because I was uh, speaking with a sponsor who ended up being not very uh, pleasant to work with, but I won't say their names. As usual, I realized I can do it better, as you can see, so this video is sponsored by myself, <laughs> the arm ring. I carry on my shop, like everything else, is based on the archaeological finds and made in Scandinavia, or at least Northern Europe, if anyone is interested. But about the sources, bracelets are things that have been used all around the world, that's no surprise. But the Norse and even the Germanic world is the one place in the world where they had the most significance, arguably, for spirituality, for ritual, for oath-making gift giving, and so much more. So in this video I'm going over all the sources to answer the question of how we can use these arm rings in our practice today. So let's look at the definition first and a uh, word that was used in Old Norse and arm ring is usually referred to as bauger, like you can see here. But it can also definitely just be referred to as ring, ringer. Um, so that can include finger rings though, so just remember that. Usually it's bauger, but sometimes they can be called ringer. Now before we move on to the actual uh, historical records of arm rings, we can speak about the mythological attestations because they are mentioned in the poetic and prose eddas. So first we have to speak about Drepnir, attested numerous times as a Bauger, so we know that that is definitely an arm ring, not a regular ring. The dwarves made this ring. Drepnir is one of the gifts given to the gods early, early on in the mythology, and it's made by the dwarves, Birkir and Aitri. It's a magic ring that every nine nights drops eight new rings, and the name Drepnir actually means the dripper, and it was a gift to the gods along with Mjölnir and and now all of these things represent different aspects in the early stages of pregnancy actually. Drepnir is when the soul is given to humans and the eight rings that drip from it every nine nights is the eight different parts of the soul. Remember this because I will come back to this a bit later in the video and it'll all make sense. Um, for now you can you can check out that other video I did on Drepnir and what the sources say on that there. Um, Next attestation of Drepnir comes in Baldr's funeral. Drepnir was also laid on the funeral pyre when Baldr was killed by his brother Hodr and Hermodr, then disguised as Odin, rides down to Hel to bring Baldr back to life and that's when he retrieves uh, Drepnir. Uh, now this reflects a real ritual that humans did. Um, we don't know quite what it is, but uh, arm rings are some of the most common things that we find in Viking Age burials all over the place. Uh, Baldr's death in the myths is symbolic of the summer and the light dying and the winter coming each year. I did videos on all that too. I'm 100% convinced of this interpretation and very clear in my opinion and a lot of other authors think that too. Uh, but maybe Possibly this arm ring on the funeral pyre was a ritual to uh, find a way to bring the light back uh, each winter that they did. Make Baldr be reborn as quickly as possible. It especially makes sense when it's the soul ring that was sent to hell with him and then brought back. So being buried with the arm ring or cremated with the arm ring was maybe a way for humans too actually to make the journey through hell smoother and to be reincarnated quicker, but that's just uh, an idea. Drepnir also comes up in Skirnismol. Um, Skirnir offers uh, Drepnir to uh, the giantess Gerdir in hopes that she would marry the god Freyr. It makes sense because this myth is, in my opinion, about the seed trying to plow and bring life to uncultivated land, which is what Freyr and Gerdir's names actually mean. And by offering Drepnir, uh, Skirnir offers a soul or spirit to that land that does not want to be plowed, and that's what Yadid is. I did a video on all that too that you can check out. 
I'll just go over another semi-mythological source we have for arm rings. Uh, in Atlakrida, uh, Gudrun spoke about how Atli swore oaths on a variety of things, and one of them being the Ring of Ull that he swore an oath upon. And oath swearing, we're going to see a lot more of this in the historical sources in a minute to come, but this is a, a perfect example where um, mythology and kind of half historical records uh, cross paths. We can also maybe speak about the famous Ring Anvaranaut. Um, it was the magic ring belonging to Anvadi and it had the power of finding gold and treasure for its owner and it was listed in all of these sources all these semi-mythological uh, sagas and poems uh, Loki stole uh, uh, this ring from Anvadi and in return Anvadi cursed the ring to bring misfortune and destruction upon those who possessed it but of course it made them rich so that was the trade-off and the ring gets passed on to all these other characters in the story um, along Sigurd and Brynhildr even towards the end of the story. It could just be a regular ring for the finger though. I have not read this original in Old Norse so I can't say but I'm inclined to believe it's an arm ring since it was passed from a god to a dwarf to a dragon to just a great strong hero to a princess so a regular finger ring would probably not fit on all those people's finger so an arm ring makes much more sense. So that's enough for the semi-mythological sources, let's get on to the actual historical ones. In Landnamabuk there was a law in the settling of Iceland where the Gothi or the leader of the all thing would be required to redden uh, his arm ring with ox blood. This isn't a sacrifice, by the way, it's the all thing, so it would be uh, like the yearly meeting where they would settle disputes, legal cases, political matters, and even here he had to redden the arm ring with blood by law. We have another a very old law in Iceland called Ulfljot's law, and that one says a ring of two ounces or more should lie on the altar of every main temple. Every man who needed to perform legal acts must, before the court, uh, swear an oath on this ring, a ring on the altar, and mention two or more witnesses. And he must say, I name the witnesses, I swear the oath on the ring, a lawful oath, so help me Freyr and Njord and the Almighty Os, the Asir, so the gods. So again, we have it used here for swearing oaths, but this one is kind of like swearing to tell the truth, kind of like in courts today. Swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, and all that blah blah shit. But if you want to do a Norse version of it, you should swear to Freyr and Njord and all the uh, Asir. Next source in Eirbyg Yasaga, it describes a pedestal in the middle of the room, a place um, where the uh, sacrificial animal animal blood would be, and by law there it was required to be a 500 gram, uh, or 20 ounces, um, I forget what measuring things they used back then, but this is just the translation that I'm reading in here, but that's how much the arm ring should weigh, so that's actually very heavy, that's more than a pound of metal, and that they would lay on top of the altar, or the pedestal, or the stone, whatever it was, and they would swear their oaths, and it was worn by the temple priest, and the ring almost appears to be like a uh, magical contract between the men and the gods and the area and the sacred space and all that. Uh, and remember these sources, like I said, because it's all going to come back to Drautnir, um, like I started with. Another one in Gesta Danorum, uh, after a young man named Vig gives King Rolf uh, his famous nickname, Kraki. King Rolf gifts Vig with a pair of arm rings, and in return, Vig uh, makes an oath and he swears that he will take vengeance on any future uh, killer of King Rolf. So, here, pledging an oath to a king in return for the gift of an arm ring, that we also see in quite a lot of other places. There's a couple skaldic poems that mention, um, like, giver of rings. Um, uh, King Harald is mentioned as uh, Snjölum Rings, the giver of rings, and we find a couple other skaldic poems and events in uh, sources like Heimskringla, in all those sagas of specifically kings who gave out many rings. So it was used uh, as a term to refer to a king who was very generous with his men. Uh, arm rings were some of the most precious 
gifts of the time, actually, and it was kind of like an unwritten rule that if you gave someone an arm ring of great value, then it was expected of you to swear at least a small oath to them and sometimes a big oath, like uh, swearing your lifetime loyalty and allegiance to them. So I want to speak about um, a couple foreign sources coming from outside Scandinavia too, just so you guys can see how widespread all these practices were. The Primary Chronicle, uh, which was about the Rus Vikings in the east of Europe, it describes how the Vikings swore by their weapons and swore by their arm rings to endorse a treaty with the Byzantines at one point. So the Vikings carried this oath-swearing practice with them all the way to the east and they still swore on the arm rings uh, for their oaths even though the other uh, uh, side may not have even given a shit about the arm rings that meant nothing to them we see another example of this in the treaty of Alfred and Guthrum which was in the mid 800s uh, Guthrum's uh, Danish Vikings entered a treaty with King Alfred the Great um, and they offered an oath on a uh, holy bracelet as uh, described in this source um, but it was not just a Viking thing um, that used these arm rings and oaths and, and practices like that. In the Deeds of the Saxons, this source, uh, Conrad I designated Herzog Heinrich uh, as his successor uh, of King of the Saxons, and he gave him an arm ring. Also, Emperor Otto III wore an arm ring at his coronation. Um, that's all in the Deeds of the Saxons. So these are the people living in Germany area that we're speaking about and then by the Viking Age by the time these events were recorded they had been officially Christian for eh, almost 200 years at that point but they still retained this aspect of oaths relating to arm rings and it shows us that arm rings are not just a Viking thing but a Germanic thing that we all did at one point. Another we can see in the old Saxon uh, Hylian poem uh, where uh, the Drochtins, which is the old Saxon word for chieftain, they gave arm rings to their thanes and their warriors for performing well in battle and for their loyalty. Arm rings are also found in old English poems such as Beowulf, a very old source telling about uh, the Vendel period in uh, uh, Denmark, uh, but uh, transferred along and we have it preserved in English sources kind of the descendants believed of uh, the uh, characters in Beowulf and again you see here it has to do with a king giving these arm rings out and fulfilling oaths like that it's also uh, comes up in some other old English poems um, and they're called uh, kings who are generous they're called both uh, gold givers and ring givers like Bega Britta so this is uh, kind of similar uh, to the old Norse uh, word Bauger um, and here they are condemned in these poems if they hoard all those things for themselves. So arm rings are even used in Anglo-Saxon England if we go back far enough. Um, we can speak about the archaeology a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go over all the attestations and, and archaeological finds of arm rings because you can see that on my website actually, um, some of the most famous ones. But in the archaeology all over northern Europe, they had special rings um, set into the pommels of their swords, like an arm ring like this, and it is believed that these rings were used as oath rings too. Oath rings were used to swear oaths upon, um, and the swords were used to swear oaths upon too. And so many, many old swords had arm rings uh, built into them, but as kind of arm rings built into the swords went out of fashion kind of by the mid to late medieval ages uh, oaths still were sworn directly upon the swords itself um, but not on the arm ring just because the ring came out of it but it's still the same idea it's just uh, kind of after Christianity came in they would swear oaths upon their sword instead of the arm ring so maybe this was a little bit too pagan for them I'll give you one final source um, called uh, Hudoliv. It's a fragmentary text um, from uh, southern Germany around the uh, year 1000 and in here arm rings were used in marriage ceremonies and it writes in here following the exchange of swords the bride and groom exchanged rings the bride's ring was offered to her on the hilt of the groom's new sword and his tendered to him in the same fashion with the rings upon their arms their hands joined upon the sword hilt uh, 
holding the sword together. They spoke their vows, and this is believed to be representing two things. First, it's swearing an oath upon the arm ring, uh, like usual, and but second, you hand the arm ring to the person by the sword like this, and then they take it and put it on their arm, so it's kind of a... Uh, like, you better do this, you better keep your oath, or else, like, you point the sword at them while they take it off, and then they both hold the sword together. This is what you have seen in many of these, um, pagan marriage ceremonies. Now, this is definitely from Christian times, but, uh, we think that this, of course, is a much older pagan original. And this is in Germany, like I said, we don't have any records resembling this type of marriage um, in any of the Norse sources, but we don't have any records of marriage ceremonies really in the Norse sources. So in my opinion, yeah, I think this arm ring on the sword, uh, oath swearing for marriage, and all these other functions for oaths was a common practice among all Germanic peoples going back to the time when we were all one. So what does it all mean with these sources? Well. Like I said, I think it all comes back to Drepnir, um, one of the earliest things in the chronology of our myths, shortly after the beginning of the universe, the soul ring that represents the eight parts to our soul and spirit. And I think the Vedic beliefs too uh, also have something similar to this, so it could reflect an ancient Indo-European common belief. Drepnir is kind of the soul ring in the mythology that we have most uh, clear records of in European uh, mythologies, but it's a good chance that this was believed in, in all um, Indo-European religions. Now, I don't think humans created arm rings because of this particular myth. I think humans created the myth and used the arm ring to put that into the story because it fits in so perfectly. The arm ring as representing the soul and you know when we see all these oaths sworn upon arm rings it's swearing an oath upon your own soul or someone else's soul meaning you damn well better keep your promise. And by kings giving these arm rings as a gift to their men, they're giving up a little part of themselves to their most loyal men. So this was no kind of basic gift that they just toss away, even though it just seems like a little crappy bracelet to us today. And then we can say by laying the arm rings on the funeral pyres and using it in burials, it represents the soul being put on there and sent to the afterlife and to be reborn, you know, cyclically, all around reincarnation, like in many other religions around the world that have used circular objects to symbolize um, cyclic life and rebirth, and just look at the shape of arm rings. It has here a little opening, so the ring is your life. You're living here and you're at the highest point in your life, and then it goes back down, goes back down, and then when you're here, this is the short period where death happens and the ring is broken, and then once you get past there, through hell, through the realm of the dead, that's when you are reborn again, and it is gone again, another life, and then another death here, and then reborn again. Also, uh, one thing that I didn't go over in this video is the sources we have on rings being used as payment. Uh, Some rings in the archaeology actually, such as this one that is based on the ring found in the Orkney Islands in the Viking settlement of Scotland, uh, these were used to uh, break in half and measure payment if you were going to buy something. Like, if you, if you were giving someone a full ring, that would be something very, very valuable. But if you just want wanted to pay him off a little bit, maybe you were buying just a little bit of food or a goat or a chicken or something, you would break up this ring into pieces oh, and give him part of that there. Uh, so it makes sense that Drepnir is represented as uh, eight parts to it, eight parts to the soul, and then we have all these folk tales and songs talking about when the ring was broken because it breaks into eight parts uh, when you die. So these can be broken. I think you can break them into about eight parts. Any more than that would be probably a little too much. But yeah, I broke up this ring for the video. Um, the first eight people who buy the rings from my online shop will get a little piece of this together so you'll all have a little bit of something from the video just as a giveaway. Check that out if you like. Those are my beliefs and the sources. It, they kind of line up together, but you guys can believe whatever you want. Either way, at least this video provided some of the sources of how arm rings were actually used. 
basically for gift giving, oath making, making oaths to your king, your gods, your spouse, your sacred place or temple, or any kind of oath in general. When you swear an oath upon uh, an arm ring like this, it is regarded as something that's uh, a promise you're not going to break. And it was probably the number one way in the Viking Age to prove that you were telling the truth. And although it was, uh, in general, a society based on honor and reputation and reliability, uh, there really were some liars around too, of course. That's for sure. That would happen in all societies. But making people swear an oath on their ring, making people swear an oath on their very soul, it would have been the best way of making making sure a person was telling the truth and keeping their word by swearing the oaths on these arm rings. And like I said in the one source uh, at the start, it seems like the proper way to um, swear an oath on these rings was you place it uh, on something, on an altar or a stone or a boulder or a hurdigid or something like that. You redden the arm ring with blood. And remember, blood was believed to kind of bring life uh, to objects like that. And also spirits are attracted to the blood and it will help invoke them. So the spirits will be there to watch you take your oath. And then you place your hand on it and you swear your oath. And uh, that is the ceremony uh, complete if you ever want wanted to do that. Oh, and probably uh, the left hand um, is the correct hand to wear oath rings on. There's no sources about that, but most of the archaeological finds um, have either had the arm ring like on top of the person or nearby somewhere, um, but if it is on their hand, it is usually on their uh, left hand. So that's about the best we know from the sources. But let me know what you guys think. Do you have any ideas, any things you are wondering about, any things that you've practiced you have felt uh, have worked let us all know in the comments we would love to hear that's why I make these videos is so we can put all of our minds together and come up with the real lost beliefs of our ancestors so that's all I have to say for today check out the shop if you like we see us next time